In this lecture, we're looking at the ongoing disputes about Christology, about the incarnation of Jesus, and their conclusion at the Council of Chalcedon. And we can begin by recapping the story as to where we've come thus far. Flowing out of Nicaea, the church had affirmed that the Son was equal with the Father, that he was homoousios with the Father, the same being, the same substance. And that had flowed down into the Council of Constantinople, which clarified the full breadth of the divinity of the Trinity, and yet also affirmed that there was a separate personhood, we've come to say, between the three persons of God. We don't worship three gods, we worship one God. But we also affirm from Scripture that there is a separation of some kind in the Trinity, and the language that the church has come down upon is that there is a separation of person. And then we notice how flowing out of the issues of Nicaea and Constantinople, whenever the Son has become fully God, that there were some who began to challenge or think about or reflect or come up with conceptions of how God came down, sometimes by a misguided attempt to protect the divinity of the Son. We first looked at the teachings of Apollinarius, who came up with a concept that the Son comes down and really only takes over part of the man Jesus, that he takes over the mind of Jesus. And we said he was well-intentioned, but wrong, that his attempt to understand the Incarnation was really driven by a desire to separate divine and human natures. And in our last lecture, we looked at the teachings of Theodore Mopsuestia and of his student Nestorius, which was a more robust and energetic description of the separation between Jesus' humanity and his divinity. And I said in that lecture that it's a bit schizophrenic in the end, that Nestorianism, at least in the main, is an idea that because the Son is fully God, that there is no way he could come down and become incarnate that he is already everywhere, so we really need no doctrine of the Incarnation, at least not in the sense that we say that God came down to save. Well, all throughout this, we've mentioned that the issues of salvation are preeminent, and we've stressed that because too often it's assumed that the doctrines of salvation really only show up a little bit with Pelagianism, which is an utterly works righteousness system. It's the idea that if you do anything, you must do works only by your own strength, and if you don't do them, well, then you will not be saved. And then too often it's said that the subject of salvation really kind of lays dormant until Luther comes on the scene banging 95 theses into a church door and suddenly everyone's talking about salvation again. But we've tried to stress throughout all of these lectures that the doctrines of salvation is really the driving force here. God came to save. God came to die on our behalf. That is really the core of the gospel. And so those even well-intentioned souls who somehow attempt to protect the divinity of the Son by denying an incarnation or denying that he came down, is ultimately suspect. Well, we can pick up in this lecture that ongoing theme, because one of the things that's often overlooked is the fact that Pelagianism is on the scene at exactly the same moment. And really what has arisen at this point is two conceptions of what Christ came to do. In the first is the teachings of Cyril and the vast majority consensus of the church, which is that we were unable to save ourselves, we were dead in our trespasses or in our sins. We were unable to save ourselves. And so God came down, took on human flesh, and died on our behalf. Now that's just a basic outline. But there's some natural instincts in there that we can appreciate. It's the idea that humanity does not save itself. And it's the idea that God saves and he comes down to do it. Well, on the other hand, around this same time is arising this idea that what God came to do is to kind of prepare a path to give examples or to grace human nature in a particular way so that that human nature is thereby able to achieve things that it never could before. In other words, when you look at Pelagianism and its radical works-based system, this idea that you have to do works to save yourself or else, and then you look at Nestorianism and some of the teachings there about how the human Jesus was simply graced by the divinity of the Son. Well, they are actually a natural boon companion, these two. Because what Nestorianism seems to be suggesting is that the salvation that Christ provided is not so much on the cross. In fact, he demurs about the cross, saying that God did not die there. That was simply the humanity of Christ. But rather, what Nestorianism tends to stress, or the paradigm that it's sort of imposing upon our understanding of the gospel, is that the grace-filled humanity of Jesus provides a way for us to achieve the works that we were unable to before. And this pattern really has as its object the idea that God prepares the way, gives us grace, and this is epitomized by the incarnation and the resurrection. 
Now we too, engraced by the Spirit of God, can perform the works for salvation, and only naturally, the Pelagian Nestorian perspective is profoundly ascetic and profoundly focused on our obligations to save ourselves. Now, obviously, that two part division is a bit overly simplistic, but you need to see the pressure here. The church is rejecting Nestorianism not only because they find it to be inadequate according to Scripture to say that God did not come down, but they're also suspicious that what is envisioned here is not that God came to save, but that God came to sort of give us the power to save ourselves. Well, after the Council of Ephesus, the first council, the Ecumenical Council, and after the formula of reunion that John of Antioch and Cyril have brought together, both really go on a PR campaign, you might say, to pacify the more extreme supporters on either side, and in particular to pacify the extreme Nestorians who are now hurt and embittered by the way that the proceedings of the First Council of Ephesus went. And we said in our last lecture that many on John's side believe that he could have been more of a buffer, more of a savior for Nestorius, and they felt betrayed by this. Cyril's supporters too, the more extreme side, felt that he was mudding the waters by cavorting with men like John and trying to woo men who were at least somewhat supportive of Nestorius, at least personally. Well, so long as Cyril and John are alive, they are capable of keeping this thing together. However, in the 440s, it all goes down like the Hindenburg. John dies in 441, and Cyril dies in 444, and not surprisingly, now that the sheriffs are gone, both extreme sides rise up, and you have a real fight on your hands. Now, I've commented throughout much of this discussion of the councils that often what you see is an overbalancing problem in the language that people use whenever they're combating one side of an issue. We've seen how when people combat against Arianism and they go too far, they can confuse in an opposite direction. Well, that's what happens here. If Nestorius is the man who simply schizophrenically divides human and divine natures, well, the more radical anti Nestorians do what? Well, they collapse the two into one another. Well, that's exactly what happens. Dioscorus, for example, one of the theologians and bishops from this time, Bishop of Alexandria, actually becomes sort of enamored with the idea, in an anti Nestorian way, of saying that there was one incarnate nature of God the Word. Now, that's vague, it's sort of purposely vague. He's trying to combat the two persons' separation between the human and divine natures in Nestorianism, and he's just brought them back together, and he talks about the one incarnate nature. Well, along comes a man by the name of Eutychus. And Eutychus becomes somewhat of an arch anti heretic, and by doing so becomes a heretic himself, at least in terms of his formulation of the language here. Now, we can go ahead and say right now, Eutychus is completely muddled and unclear as to what he means by any of these things. But again, the issue is not so much that Eutychus came up with these ideas out of thin air, but rather he wants to kind of be what I call a theology of nuh uh, <laughs> which is the idea like kids on a playground that when you don't like something, you just say nuh uh, and you just go the opposite direction. Well, that's Eutychus. Eutychus argues and teaches that the humanity and the divinity of Christ essentially come together in such a way that the distinction between the two is utterly obliterated. There's a bit of a slogan that's often attributed to Eutychus, which is he says that like a drop of wine into the sea, so the humanity of Christ was swallowed up and lost, and that the divinity of Christ took over entirely. Well, that just simply does the opposite problem. Again, let's go back to the paradigm. God came down to save, and he saved us by being like us in every way, except without sin. Well, what Eutychus has done here is said, God came down, tried to take on humanity, and swallowed it up entirely. Lost it entirely. Well, I think this proves the axiom that the answer to one extreme is hardly ever the opposite extreme. <laughs> Eutychus, or as it's known, Eutychianism, is a radical blending or fusion of the two. And again, since we're talking about an infinite sun, an omnipresent sun, and a finite and a particular humanity, well, the divine side is going to win out, and therefore the humanity is entirely lost in Eutychus's teaching. Well, this all came to a head in 448, with a synod of Constantinople, which was presided over by Flavian. Well, Flavian had, in a manner of speaking in his back pocket, something that's known as Leo's Tome, or the Tome to Flavian written by the Bishop of Rome at the time, Leo. And Pope Leo's book argued pretty extensively, not for Nestorianism, obviously, 
but against Eutychianism. And the language that Leo used was that he described the unity of Christ, the simple unity of him, as God come down. And he says that the priority of our expression is that it is the divine nature that came down, meaning we have no problem with saying that a man named Jesus died on the cross. But we're going to put a priority, we're going to put an emphasis on the fact that it's God come down in human flesh. But Leo stresses that there is a simple unity in the incarnation, and we're not going to try to understand it in a philosophical or a theological sense. But rather, we're going to affirm a unity, but we're going to stress that it is God come down. Well, Flavian condemns Eutychus, but it's not over yet. In 449, again, because the controversy is still swirling, there is called a second council of Ephesus. And this council was to be Ephesus too. It was to be the fourth ecumenical council, but it was an utter mess. Not surprisingly, because Flavian had presided over the Synod of Constantinople, now Dioscorus steps in, the man who had sort of inspired Eutychus's ideas. And he kind of flips the tables. Now Flavian is condemned, and Dioscorus reinstates Eutychus. And this is just simply a violent kind of torturous experience at this council. If Ephesus I was a mess, Ephesus II is an utter mess, and it is done entirely for political and personal reasons. Dioscorus simply has the bully pulpit, he condemns Flavian, and restores Eutychus without really any care or concern for Leo's tome or for any of the other theological consensus of the world. He just simply gets what he wants. Well, not surprisingly, Leo rejected this council entirely. And, as a result, Ephesus II, as it was supposed to be, has forever gone by the name the Robber Council. Now, that name, the Robber Council, is given by the actual Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon. They claim that Ephesus, the Synod of Ephesus in 449, had betrayed the very nature of a council which was to hear the consensus of the church, and rather Dioscorus and Eutychus conspired to get Eutychus off the hook. And so the Robber Council of Ephesus is null and void, at least according to later history. Well, the controversy continues, and finally, in 451, there is called the Council of Chalcedon. Now, it is such an important council here because the issues and the fights ensuing thus far involve bishop against bishop, fight against fight, and a rather extremist view on either side. And as a result, over 500 bishops and leaders show up for the Council of Chalcedon. They want to put an end to this mess. And it's sometimes been alleged that the Council of Chalcedon really is inventive in its language of Christology. And we're going to talk about a couple of these phrases and words here in a minute. They do come to conclusions on language, and they decide one way or the other, as we're about to say. But I think if you look at the ensuing problems and the fights and the backs and forth that we have up until the Council of Chalcedon, I think, hopefully, you can see that the Council of Chalcedon is actually a more sane representation of the Church's consensus. What they're trying to do is simply put a stop to all this back and forth and to once and for all end the extremism between the sides. And, they know, if they kill off the theological bones of contentions between either side, and if they can come up with a framework, if they can put the bumpers on the bowling alley, as I've said about the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople, if they can say, you can go this far in one direction and this far in the other direction and stop, don't go any further, stop speculating, and shut up. <laughs> if Chalcedon can manage to do this, then in the end, ideally, the church would be restored to peace. Well, the council's decision is a couple of points. Obviously, they annul and they create the concept that Ephesus I was a robber council. And they condemn it for its inappropriate proceedings. They don't stop there, though. They move on and they accept, again, Leo's tome, his attempt to come up with a consensus argument that we have a unity of Christ in the incarnation, that there are two natures, and that we're not going to fight about what is the difference between the two, or which one is the biggest of the two. Though Leo, of course, does again stress that the priority of emphasis is on the divinity that the Son came down to save. They do also come up with a formula or a creed known as the Chalcedonian Creed, or the Chalcedonian Formula. Now, I think if you were to have read this document before the lectures thus far, it would sound a bit strange. It, it uses language about the consubstantiability of the Son in terms of his divine and human natures. I've actually had students say to me, I can accept Nicaea as simply putting it into Arius, and I can accept the homoousios word because really it's simply protecting the divinity of the Son. But you start talking about the consubstantiability of the Son's incarnated nature, and give me a break. 
Well, again, hopefully by now you can see what they're going to do. Essentially, what they're going to do is put parameters around our language. They're going to stop all of the speculation. And so the Council of Chalcedon comes up with a creed that I think is, frankly, pretty ingenious. Because what it does is it reaches back to Nicaea, and it picks up the language of being and of personhood, of natures and substances, etc. And it applies it again to the sun. And the formula that they come up with is very simple in a manner of speaking. It has essentially two moves. It says, when we're talking about the divinity of the Son, we affirm that he is consubstantial with the Father. Again, that is an affirmation of Nicaea all the way back. What they then do is they turn to the humanity of Jesus. And they say that when we're describing the humanity of Jesus, we're going to affirm that he is, here's the word again, consubstantial with us in every way. Now, again, I think that is actually pretty ingenious because everyone by this point is pretty hyper Nicaea. They affirm that the Son is like the Father in every way. And what they've done now, again, taking verses like Romans 5 and others where we describe that the Son had to become incarnate, and they've basically said he is like us in every way as well in his humanity. They then go on and they say that there is a simple unity of the Son in the incarnated Jesus. And they say, don't confuse it. Don't mix it. Don't separate it. Don't deny one. Don't kill one. Don't come up with a formula or an algorithm to understand how this works. Rather, God came down to save, and he was like us in every way. Therefore, if you're going to be describing the divinity of the Son, that he is divine, do not lose the language that he is like the Father in every way. He is fully God. He's not an angel. But don't allow that to confuse, they say, that he is like us in every way. And he is they use the word consubstantial, of the same substance as we are, which is frankly just another way of saying he's like us in every way. He had flesh and blood. He had an incarnated body. He was human. He died on our behalf. And so, in the end, where the Council of Chalcedon has landed is a very simple formula for understanding how we can describe our understanding of Christ as the incarnate God come to save, that pins us in, that it hems in the boundaries. And it says, do not transgress outside of these. It's not our place. The scriptures don't give us mention of this. And therefore, we affirm that he is both God and man. Now, often in the modern world, what we try to do is we try to say that he is 100% God, 100% man. That's not where Chalcedon goes. They haven't just sort of come up with a, I don't know, let's just say he's both of everything. Not in that simplistic of a way. Rather, what they're doing is they're putting an end to the ongoing speculation the ongoing attempt to make one bigger or more powerful than the other, or to separate the two. They're saying, guys, the Bible gives us both. He's like us in every way, but he is God come down. That's all we can say. And as we've come to the conclusions based off of the teachings of Arius, we're going to say that the Son is not a creature. He's not less than the Father. He and the Father are one. But don't mistake that as an opportunity to say that he did not come down to take on human flesh, to die on our behalf. So at the end, this is the fourth ecumenical council. Now, there are seven ecumenical councils affirmed by the church, but the first four are the primary theological ones. Five, six, and seven deal with theology at times, but not to this magnitude. However, we can say a few things about the first four sort of overall, again, to recap. Salvation is the primary issue at stake. The primary position, essentially, of all the councils is that God came down to save. And even though it's messy, even though it's problematic, and even though it causes us to wince from time to time, these councils help shape our language, not in terms of inventing language, but rather in terms of limiting it very often. Or in those places where words and language are developed, again, they're often developed in a way that limits us from going too far in one direction or the other. In a manner of speaking, the first four ecumenical councils sue for simplicity. They press us to stick to the text, stick to the essentials of the biblical language, the essential story of the gospel, that Jesus is God, but he is also human. And he came down, and because of that, our Lord died on our behalf as a purchase for our sins. (laughs) 